Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the podcast today. This is Eric Johnson, Coach EJ, the brand. And Coach Aaron Thigpen, the source. Guys, um, we're still doing our, what I'm calling our NorCal Heavy Hitters series. It's basically where we're talking to some of what we consider some of the uh, giants in the travel baseball industry, especially on the West Coast here. Um, these are guys who have storied uh, histories with travel baseball and and probably have not only been a part of uh, travel baseball, but been instrumental in how it looks today. And, and one of those guys I have today is Tony Crivello. He's uh, with NorCal Baseball. Uh, again, Tony, I'm, I'm sorry, but I forgot if you have an official title. I've known you for <laughs> 30 <laughs> odd years, but I've never really worried about a title. But um, uh, NorCal Baseball is probably one of the most storied travel baseball programs in the country, mm -hmm. not just the West Coast. Uh, these guys have had over 700 plus D1 commits. Uh, 300 athletes drafted into Major League Baseball, 58 big leaguers, and uh, 22 first rounders. Uh, so very storied program, a great history. I think you guys are going on 30 years now. And yeah, we just, just kind of finished up our 30th year here. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of you guys are, are participating in a vehicle that these guys were instrumental in developing. I mean, what you're seeing today and what you're participating in today is something that these guys were on the ground floor of, of putting into place. So I, I really like to salute you guys. And I want to have, I want your, I want baseball athletes to understand the history of not just baseball, but some of these things that are instrumental in their development and, and act as a, uh, a vehicle for these guys to achieve success. And, and that's one reason why I want to have Tony on. Um, of course, if any guys know NorCal baseball, you also know Rob Bruno. But, um, you know, there's always other people. And I think um, Tony has been just a crucial part of, of NorCal baseball's development. And, you know, it's kind of like a, um, uh, a race car group. You know, you have the driver, <laughs> you have the, the car. But you also have a chief mechanic that makes everything work. And they don't always get the shine, but they're crucial to uh, the success that an organization has. And uh, that was one reason why I wanted to have Tony on, get his perspective. Again, we'll have Rob Bruno on, big personality. You know <laughs> that. And that's, uh, so I'm putting you on the spot, Rob. Call me back. Yeah. Um, I can't <laughs> say enough. I mean, I've, I've known these guys for probably almost 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, they were, Rob sent me some of the, uh, my first clients uh, that I had, uh, Brandon Buckley and Aaron McNeil. Yep. Uh, they were draft uh, draftees to the uh, Houston Astros organization. And again, that's going back God, 20, 27 wow. years, something like that. Yeah, we started sending guys, Chris Gruler, you know, yeah. all those guys started, started going over there. Um, it was a big, uh, you know, that was the beginning of, of training. Yeah, You know, in reality, that was a long time before guys just played. And that was still the era of multiple sports being played. So no one really, quote unquote, trained right. for, for sports. But um, credit to, to you and to, you know, guys like EJ and uh, I think like myself and Rob, where maybe we saw that uh, the training aspect was was becoming a lot more important as players became bigger, faster, stronger, you kind of either started to go with that trend or you started to fall behind. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, so it became important. Yeah. It's funny. I, I was thinking about this because I think about Alan Jager, mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, you guys, EJ, all of us that kind of almost started around the same time. Yeah. And yeah. what's funny is we all, at least for me, and I think even you guys, we all kind of fell into this, but we never saw it being what it is now. At least I didn't, you know, this huge industry. Yeah. Um, and, and for the good and bad. But uh, I think a lot of us just did this because we liked our sports. We liked our, you know, we liked working with the kids. We wanted to help the kids. 
And, you know, now it's, you know, it's, it's big business with, you know, for better or for worse. But um, I also wanted to name drop uh, a few of these, a few guys that uh, NorCal has had over the years uh, for some of the athletes and parents that are listening out there. Um, these guys have had Jimmy Rollins, Troy, and I'll probably blow this name up, Tulowski, Dustin Pedroia, Jock Pitt. Uh, mm -hmm. Peterson, Brandon Crawford, Tyson Ross, Joe Ross, Robert Stevenson, David Dahl, John Jassel, Jason Castro, Tyler Goodell, Dontrell Willis, J.P. Howell, Brandon Morrow. I mean, and then you guys had two last year first round picks, Spencer, mm -hmm. Spencer Torkelson and Tyler Soderstrom. I mean, it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this year we had Bobby together. Snelling and Henry Bolte, two, uh, two new ones this past draft. See, <laughs> that's right. Cool. right. Yeah, and I was also reading that you guys had uh, had averaged something like fourteen D one commits, or over fourteen years, twenty plus D one commits in your organization. Yeah. So yeah. we're talking about pedigree. We're not talking about guys who just been in business for thirty years, but you know, you guys have held a standard that is pretty much you know unparalleled and unmatched in all of travel baseball across the country. So right. um, without further ado, I want to uh, get started. <laughs> and um, I want you to tell me a little bit about NorCal, you know, give people a quick synopsis. Cause again, there's people who have, may not have heard of you and haven't been in that, our ecosystem that I think uh, should know what you guys are and, and, and what you're about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So first of all, thanks guys for having me out. I'm always, I'm always happy to talk baseball and uh, try to promote it. And that's so real quick, and I'll kind of get into maybe our philosophy. But yeah, so years ago, back in 1995, uh, Rob Bruno, who uh, him and I partner now with uh, with NorCal Baseball, he was a scout with the Angels at the time, and he was one of the very first uh, scout teams in Northern California. And he called it uh, the NorCal Angels. And he'd had a team before that called the Black Sox, the NorCal Black Sox. Mm -hmm. But when he became a uh, scout for the Angels, he put together a scout team. And he actually recruited my younger brother at the time. And I had just kind of got done playing. Um, and my life was kind of in limbo, right? Like, what do I do now? I still love sports. I still love that. And he asked, if I, hey, you want to come out and throw some BP for our scout team? And that's really how we got started. That's literally how Robin and I met. And that turned into, hey, I helped out a little bit. Um, year or two later, all of a sudden, I'm doing a team. He's doing a team. And that's how NorCal kind of got started. But I think our the thing that helped us grow just as a, as a group and as a, as a program, NorCal Baseball, was exactly what you said. We never envisioned it any more than just we loved being around baseball. Um, we loved trying to help kids. At the time when we first started, there was no travel leagues. There were no tournaments. There were like, you had to go. We played a bunch of the junior colleges at the time because that's who was available. EJ, you were around. that. It was like, there just wasn't much to do. We played some of the like um, Babe Ruth all-star teams that were heading off to their state tournaments. Like we were their warm-up games. Um, mm -hmm. We did that, and then we went to the Junior Olympics from AAU. That was really all that was out there. Um, and so we just spent a lot of time together as a team, uh, worked, and again, we just, we've just we seen it go from that to every weekend there's tournaments and championships, and it's just it's become a complete cottage industry, for better or worse. Yeah. You know, I hear a lot of people say, man, don't you wish it was back when it was just, you know, this, this, and that, and it's – my answer is always no, like there should be a spot for anybody that wants to play baseball. That baseball doesn't have to be played by only good players. Mm -hmm. If you have a love for the game, why can't you go find a spot that you can play, right? Okay. right. It shouldn't just be elite baseball or travel should just be the elite players. Like why? If I'm, if I'm a player who maybe I'm not going to be good enough to go on after high school. Well, that doesn't mean I shouldn't get to play all those summer games and all those fall games with my team, right? right? We promote baseball, and that's that's really been, I think, what's held us out is our mm -hmm. 
at least from my side and Rob's, like we believe in the promotion of baseball. We run events that uh, encompass players from all other organizations, right? Our NorCal World Series and some of our fall things. And I tell people and our players all the time, look, man, we're here to promote baseball. I don't care who you play for. If, if you play for us, great. But if you're playing for EJ, if you're playing for, um, you know, um, all the other guys there, Eric Rice down at CCB, you're playing for Drew Henning and those guys up at, uh, you know, SSC, or, you know, you're playing for, for guys like Adam Farb or whatever. Like, it doesn't matter to me. When we do an event to try to promote baseball, everybody's welcome, you know? Um, and so for me, it's always been that way. And, and, it, and I've fallen in love with baseball even more during this just because it's been a nice, um, you know, I, I, my religion and my background, and I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian guy. And so I really felt that baseball has been a calling for me in my ability to just be able to, I'm a teacher and now I'm a principal and all those things. So like my life's been revolved around trying to influence kids and baseball has been an avenue that's just blossomed for me. And so my passion for it has grown and continues to grow. Um, and just to touch real quick, um, you had mentioned like, you know, yourself and, and Eric and a lot of us guys have been around and none of us saw it ballooning into this, right? Mm -hmm. But you you hit it when you said, we all were in it for the right reasons. And I think that's why we've our longevity has been there. Right. It's true. When you go play for Eric, you know, man, he's he's there for you. He's not there for his ego, right? When you, when you go to train with you, you're not putting your stamping, hey, that's my dude, right? right? When our guys get drafted... Yeah, hey, great for us. But look, the kid put the work in. Right. We created an avenue. We sent him to you. We sent him to this. We, I mean, I still remember sitting with Alan Jager 20 plus years ago at a BJ's restaurant in Orange County. And he was this weird guy who talked about long toss. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And all of a sudden now, everybody, I mean, look at him. You yeah. know, he does such a great job. But he was way ahead of his time with this idea of like, hey, man, treat your body right. And things will happen because back then no one talked about that stuff, but he's in it for the right reason too. You even talk to him today. There's times when we've talked and I'll call him for, and it was like a year ago, we, we I called him for a question an hour and like 45 minutes later, I'm like, all right, good talking to you. Right. <laughs> but it's all about good stuff because we're, our passion is there. Right. And our passion for kids is there. Yeah. yeah. And we, we actually have a podcast with Alan that we've, had on the shelves and we're going to actually actually I'm going to pull it out for this series but it's uh champions are built and we have a great conversation with Alan and yeah uh, you, got, you guys definitely listen for that and, and look forward to and he that. rings true the same way oh, like yeah. I said he you can tell like there's nothing it's not about him right um and that's and again for me that's why for for me NorCal's been that way and like you mentioned with Rob like we're the you know, we're kind of like the yin and the yang, right? Like Rob is, is the face. He gets out there. He does all that stuff. I'm a much more behind the scenes guy. Like let's make things, let's organize, let's get some right. fun, um, standpoint and, you know, my passion for, with the kids. Um, and so in, in Rob is, is, is that big personality. And so he can, he can, you know, take those things that I don't necessarily am looking for um, and where I can step up to things where maybe he's not looking for. And so it, it's been a great partnership for years uh, with it. And we've, we've migrated to guys, you know, that have been part of our program and influences, you know, Jerry Weinstein, Alan Jager, the, all those guys, because I feel like we all come from the same spot, right? Yeah. We want, we're here for the kids. We want to get better as coaches and mentors and we want our kids to see that. And I think it rings true for sure. You know, funny in, in this series, Aaron, you know, and, and, you know, we, we talk about these heavy hitters of NorCal, all the people that Tony's talked about right now, you know, we're all taken from the same cloth. We all are involved because we enjoy helping kids and helping them in their lives and trying to get them where they need to be. And I think that if all the people out there listening, you know, all the people we've had in these series and all these podcasts we've done and talked about these people that have influenced, you know, baseball in Northern California, NorCal is, is one of them. I remember when we first started and we, you know, he was going to the AU championships. I was going to China with a group 
and we would just play because we all just love the game. We want to get players on the field to play. And uh, that's how this all started. And I remember when Adam, Adam had a team, Farb had a team and, you know, he's coached a team and he just all of a sudden all this stuff manifested because we love the game. And for all the people out there and all the stories they hear about all these people, these heavy hitters, we, we all love the game and love having kids. And Tony, you can have said any better. You're promoting the game. And that's what we're all trying to do here is promote the game because we feel that's the fiber and that's what keeps the game going is the promotion of the game, not about the other stuff you see out there. And that's important for people to understand. Everybody has a level to play at. You mm -hmm. know, and 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 it's funny thing is, uh, as Aaron and I are in the shop all the time, we always talk about, hey, this guy is going to go here. This is good. He's got something he can do. He's working on this. And it's so important. So I tell parents and players out there, don't be influenced by all the things you see out there in the media about this is that this is that. Listen to what Tony has to say. He's a great, outstanding resource for you whether you play for him or not people talk to him this is one of the heavy hitters in northern california on baseball that's part of baseball history um from 1990 and on you know so i think we're pretty lucky aaron to have have tony here today man oh without a doubt hey so tony um i want to get into a little bit more meat here now yeah and you know, because of the longevity you guys have had in the sport, just want to get a, a general opinion on um, what have been the, the changes for good and for bad over the years that you see, you know, in travel baseball. Um, I, I, I love that you said that, you know, you like actually the proliferation of, of travel teams, but I'm sure there's a caveat to that in terms of quality and purpose and <laughs> that sort of thing. But um, I, I like that you said that there should be a place for everyone to play, because I do think that what you're getting at is everyone should be able to experience baseball to its fullest. And 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 that includes those things that, you know, provide those memories for athletes of, hey, we went to play in Peoria, we went to play in, you know, such and such. And maybe they don't do anything more than that. But I think that adds to the sports experience in the, and what kids get out of sports. So in terms of just, you know, this, this span of 30 years, what are some of the good and bad things? Maybe give me two or three good things, two or three bad things um, that have happened with the industry, if there are any. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think there, the, the good things about it, and it is driving home that point that, you know, we don't remember necessarily the wins, right? And sometimes the loss is evil. What we remember is the experience. Right. I don't, I mean, this is not a pat on my back or anything like that, but I don't have a trophy or a medal or a anything in my house from anything I've done. Right. I have pictures. Mm -hmm. I have things, you know, people have sent me. I have, you know, I have this really cool, this time we got to, um, years ago down at USC, we got to play the Chinese Taipei Olympic team. You know, so there's a picture with us and the team and my team and, Coach Dato from USC. And it's like, those are the memories. I don't even remember the game at all. But I remember sitting in the dugout with Coach Dato, who's the legend, you know, if you know baseball on USC, the most legendary coach, you know, maybe ever on the West Coast, right? Before um, some other guys. But sitting in the dugout with him talking to my players and mm -hmm. thinking to myself this idea, like, I don't think these players are going to realize how like crazy it is that they're talking to coach Dado right now <laughs> at some point in their life, they will, right. but you know what I mean? But we remember the experiences. And so to me, having kid, not being, not drawing, you know, like these limits, like you have to be this good to have that experience. Yeah. Right. So uh, with the expansion of the, with baseball, Hey, like I said, you may not be great at baseball, but you love it. And right. you still get to go somewhere and play. You know, I hear sometimes people's like, oh, that tournament, that's like for like, you know, uh, double A or single A teams or whatever. And it's like, and what does it matter? Like those kids are having a great time. And you know what? At their level of play, that is as difficult for them as the elite guy playing at an elite tournament. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all the same just because, I mean, I mean, you know, um, 
just because you finished first doesn't mean you gave your best effort, right? You know that, Aaron. I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're, your background is is track, right? right? You know races where I don't have to run my fastest to win this race, right? right? Mm -hmm. Just because. And so, hey, as far as I'm concerned, you don't, you know, just because you're not at that level, but you're given 100% as a kid. So for me, I love the fact that it has created environments for kids that, and you know what? Maybe they they really mature late. We've had plenty of guys. I'll give a, a perfect example. I'm not going to embarrass him and use his name, but we have a kid in our 24 class. When he came to us two years ago, five foot six, maybe 110 pounds. But you know what? He was a bulldog. Like this kid busted his butt, played hard. And I said, you know, I'm just going to keep him around because you never know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Here we are two years later, he's 5'10", he's 175, 80 pounds, he just committed to a D1 school, like, wow. you know what I mean, like, but if you were to gauge him two years ago, you'd have said, he's a kid who just playing double, single A, triple S, U triple S A type stuff, right, mm -hmm. but the fact that there's a level for everyone I love, I think that, and that does help grow the game, um, the other positives too that I think has happened is that people have started to understand how to take care of themselves and take lessons from baseball. I think it has created an environment with guys like you and Alan and, and the, uh, you know, some of the guys that uh, run up, uh, you know, um, uh, the guys up in SAC who do a great job and with training, right? So th we've created an environment where there's a lot of information and you can really, you can really kind of delve into your passion, not just playing, but how do I get better? Right. Don't just tell a kid, hey, go get better and I'll see you. And you're like, hey, now they can train. They can do a lot of things. And that makes them, I think that creates opportunities for kids to learn about just dedication in life, not just baseball, right? Um, how, to, how to make a plan for yourself. All those things. So with, with the explosion of all that, I think it's great. Um, it's obviously made um, opportunities for families to travel together and give them things to do. So I think all that stuff is super positive. Now, <laughs> the negative, yeah. The, yeah, there's, it, it's almost like all those things also create some sort of negative. I, I think we have certain programs and in, 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 maybe individuals who are, who unfortunately become like defined by how their team does yeah. and how their program does. Yeah. And I think that that's a, that's a negative, unfortunately for the, the, the people running the program or the coaches, but it's a negative for the kids also. Because sometimes these kids are treated like commodities. Like, I've got this many players that are this good. We've right. got this many kids that are uh, – and that's that's not healthy because eventually it washes out where they, if you're not there for the right reasons, it just – it does it's not helpful for the kids. Um, I think the social media aspect has put kind of a bad spin. You know, like, it just – this is kind of like a bigger theme for life, right? But – not everyone's a D1 player, but if you look at Twitter, they're all D1 players, right? <laughs> no one, you know, no one's really, you know, posting things that aren't spectacular. Right. And so we all assume I'm falling behind. I'm a freshman and I'm not committed. Right. Okay. The 0.05% of freshmen are committing. <laughs> That's the way, I mean, that they're out there, but that, that yeah. doesn't mean, and with social media though, it seems like a lot more. Right. We're in California with what, 38, 40 million people and three or four eighth graders commit and every eighth grader in California now thinks they're behind. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so I think that's maybe the negative is that we've started to put pressure on kids that right. remember baseball is supposed to be fun. I tell my players the first time I meet them, the number one rule to play for NorCal is you got to have fun. If you cease having fun and it becomes a job, it's not going to be enjoyable and you're not going to reach your potential, right? Very rarely when something is a job, do we reach our potential with it. When we're doing something we love and have a passion for that turns out to be a job or a thing, that's when we reach our potential. And so if we can keep baseball as something you love and it just so happens that it helps you out in life, right? You get to keep playing. It helps for school. You, you, you create these incredible habits playing sports that I, I believe, like just life habits. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, why do you think FBI, CIA, all these top programs, they go after athletes. Mm 
Yeah. Because they know they've been able to dedicate themselves to mm -hmm. things. And so that's where I can, that's, I think, where we come from. But again, that negative is when it becomes too important to win Sunday at <laughs> X complex, right? right? Or if you aren't winning the tournament, you guys can't be that good, right? right. Um, you know, Gary Baldwin out at East Cobb, who's, you know, a legend, right? I mean, EJ, right. you know, I mean, you know, oh, yeah. the godfather of baseball, almost really for travel baseball with this complex at East Cobb. And uh, I remember one time him, him saying like, hey, T I remember we, we played each other and it was a great game and uh, they went on to go to the finals and they lost. And I talked to him the next day. And I was like, hey, coach, you know, hey, tough loss. Huh? And he's like, I got a game tomorrow, Tone. Like, <laughs> That's right? exactly we're, it. We're here for the guys. That was just another blip on the screen. Uh, yeah. You know, my job is to make my kids better. Whether we won or lost, man, the lesson is, did we get better? you know, as a person and as a player. And I mean, that's just, that's held true for me for so long, right? A guy who could have been, no, he's fiery. I get it, all that stuff. But he was just like, yeah, my job is to make them better people and better players. The yeah. wins or losses are just whatever. They're just a, a teaching tool, you right. know? So, um, so those that are doing it that way, I think are complete positive. Mm -hmm. Those that are looking at it as we have to win, and they're putting pressure on the kids that it has to happen this way. That's clearly the negative because you're probably losing kids, you know, yeah. and you're burning out passions for baseball. Yeah, I think, Tony, um, you, you can have said that any better. And I think about Baldwin back at East Cobb, and we played him so many times. And, you know, that matter of factly, uh, yeah, we got a game tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. and regardless if you, you beat them or you want it the same way and yeah fiery and all that stuff you said it but you know again it goes back to those people with the same cloth and and, and getting back to some things you said something about I, I love this what you said Tony about some of the good experiences life habits because baseball teach you so much about yourself and I think that gets lost in translation you know when we take players on as coaches, we want to teach them about life and baseball is a microcosm of their life. And I think that's important. I tell the parents out there is that, you know, uh, sports is great. Sports teaches you a lot about habits, life habits, uh, how to get along with people, be a good teammate, how to work in an environment. So that's great. That's, that's great to hear, Tony, because, you know, that gets lost a lot out there in this industry. This industry is so by uh, whether it's a Twitter tweet or it's a Instagram or a, a TikTok video um, that gets lost in translation behind what we're all trying to do is the better, the betterment of the game and the betterment of people. So that's mm -hmm. real cool. Aaron, what, what, you, what you thinking, man? What you thinking? Well, he, he anticipated my, my one question. <laughs> uh, you know me, I always got to ask about the social media aspect and get yeah. everyone's opinion on that. And I, and you know, I, I agree with you, Tony. Um, but let, let's move on to another one. Um, what do you think <clears throat> should be the future evolution of, of travel baseball. Um, you know, you've got a lot of things that are going on now. Obviously, social media is one part of that. And, <clears throat> and I was just, again, just kind of, you know, this might be out of left field or something, but I was musing last night and it's, it's like, well, you know, what about like, you know, um, NLI, you know, and that sort of stuff, you know, permeating mm -hmm. the sport because now you know everyone wants to have a vehicle to make a dollar and yeah and just just curious as to what are some of the things that you th think travel baseball might be moving towards that may be good trends or maybe bad trends or, or directions that we really should be going into it could be even i know ej is involved in this is um bringing baseball back to you know, some of the minority communities. Yeah. Um, and and those sorts of projects. And and so what are, what are just maybe some of your thoughts on on where you'd like the future of, of travel baseball to go? Yeah, it's funny because I was thinking about this today when we we talked about getting together to do this. And one of the things that I think that has happened with the ebb and flow of you know training and um baseball and stuff is that 
I think now we've lost a little bit because what's happened now was kids are playing and training. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're playing all these games and they're training. But I think what's starting to get lost, and this is what we're trying to do again, just again, not that we're special, but what we're trying to do focus with NorCal is like, we want to practice. Like we want time to practice. Like our fall, we get together on Sundays and we practice for four hours. Yeah. Right. We're doing drills. We're doing something. Like that, and we're when we enter squad, it's controlled. We stop the game. I run guys out to the middle of the field and go, here's what happened, fellas. Like, where should you have been? Why did the ball go here? And we move, let this guy move up to second. All those little things. I think that we as, a, as an industry have almost fooled kids into thinking that if you train really hard, then you come out and play a bunch of games. That's the recipe. Mm-hmm. I talked to some coaches this um, this summer, and some of the co- and you can see some of them talking, and you could see it almost oozing out of them, like, and them saying, "Hey, Tone, I, I've got all these All Americans. They just don't know how to play the game. Right. They're they, they are f- training freaks. They're very good. They can hit, run, throw, but but I've got to be honest, they still don't throw it to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> they still they we still don't line up the right way." Um, and so I think that's really where I'd love to see it go. Like we don't always need a 200 team tournament or a 50 team. Like sometimes what we need is three teams to get together on a weekend and play each other and not worry about winning or losing, but to say, look, I'm going to, when you want to stop the game coach, if I'm playing Eric and I go, Hey, Eric, we've done this before. Eric, you want to roll an inning so you can talk to your guys. You want to stop the game and talk to your guys. Let's do that. Absolutely. You know, because they're going to learn way more from us saying, okay, everybody stop. Let's see what went wrong there. Right. So that next time we can do a little better. Right. Uh, but I think we've, we've almost fooled ourselves into thinking train, 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 play, play, play. You become a good player. Right. Well, what's happening now, I think you are finding guys like that old idea of like baseball IQ mm-hmm. is starting to stand out. Yeah. Right. The big, like, the fastest runner is not your best base stealer. It's mm-hmm. the instinct guy. And it's always been that way, right? right? right. But because of training, we, we fall in love with metrics. You his 60s is this. The next question. Yep. Yeah, his <laughs> 60s are this. His arm is this. His yeah. bat speed is this. And it's like, yes. those are all terrific. Yes. But bottom of the eighth, runner first and second, can you, can you move them over? Can you get the right jump that's needed to score? I don't care how fast you are. We, you, you talked about when we first started um, and talking about Jimmy Rollins, we had uh, three guys that were faster than Jimmy, a lot faster than Jimmy, Shanti Davidson, um, you know, Juan Hernandez, Anthony Limbrick, all three of them, they were our outfielders, were, were faster than Jimmy, clearly faster. One guy I wanted running bases when it mattered. Jimmy Rollins. And it was Jimmy because <laughs> he was fast, but I, he could score. He right. if that ball the dirt. He got the bag. The other guys, they were just much more at like, if you just said, Hey, those guys flew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they did. But the instinct was better with a guy like Jimmy. And again, obviously that's a, maybe not the best example. Cause he was so high, his IQ and everything was just innate. Right. I mean, you guys, everybody who saw him play, you knew people ask me all the time, Hey, how do you know? Do you know when a guy has a potential? And it's like, you kind of do. Right. I mean, you know, sometimes this guy probably, I mean, I remember Aaron, when we had uh, Mark Appel and Christian Jones in there training all yep. the time. Mm-hmm. I remember, I still remember you and I talking and you asked like, hey, those guys kind of look like it and they're doing it. And I'm like, yeah, those guys are probably going to be big leaguers. Like, unless something happens, you know, physically or something. Um, so I think I'd like to see that idea of trying to teach the IQ in the game. I think, I think that's getting lost a lot. You know, playing a hundred games doesn't make you a better player, right? Taking a hundred swings doesn't make you a better player unless it's the right swings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Playing a hundred games where we're able to learn, that makes you a better player, not playing a hundred games. Yeah. So that's something I'd like to see. And I know, but you know, that's tough because there's no money in that. Okay. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> you talk about where we go, what we do, look, it costs money. Let's, let's not fool ourselves here. These guys with complexes and things like that, it costs money, man, to make. And so no, there's no 
hate on anybody trying to make some money off of right. you know, tournaments mm -hmm. and things like that because they're built for a reason. A city doesn't build a complex to sit there, right? Right, and the guy doesn't run all that stuff to just push. Like there's so that's all fine, but I do think that um, you know where we're headed with social media and like you talked about, you know, like name and likeness and all that stuff. I'm, you know, I don't want to say like, it's not a bad word, but I'm a capitalist in the sense of, look, if someone's making money off these athletes, there ain't no reason why these athletes shouldn't be getting a little bit of that. So if, even if I hate the fact that it's trickling down and it's causing it to become more of a business, mm -hmm. but if you're going to be running a business around someone, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. This you know, potential first round pick or second round pick, like, and you're going to all of a sudden make money, then maybe we got to find a way. I mean, we're seeing it happen in the NCA right now. Right. And it's not going well. I personally, it does not look like it's going well, you know, with the transfer portal and all this. And like, it's just, it's going to, it's the wild West, man. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> if you get the, yeah. I don't know if you get the cab back in the bag or not with yeah. all this. But I mean, EJ, you probably have a, maybe a little bit more insight on some of that stuff than I do. Um, but it, it sure seems like we're headed in that direction. And I think it's great for people to capitalize because if someone's, you know, like I said, I mean, as a capitalist type guy, like if someone's making something off of you as a person, you, you need to have some say in that. And if that means monetary, it needs to be monetary. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's tricky. It's a tricky industry right now. It's something that's not uh, monitored very well, and it's uncertain. There's uncertainty there. Yeah. So with that being, people do what they want to do with it and see what they can get through. There's no rule. There's no governing body yet that says, right. hey, we got to do this. Um, so that's that's what's interesting about this whole thing. Uh, they say certain things, and there's different rules every every six months or three months or whatever. So that's probably the trickiest thing with that, with, uh, and sports, because football and basketball are different than baseball, you know, yes. and all that stuff. So we're seeing a lot of that. Tony, you said something that really just um, struck a chord with me. And you and I have been saying this for as many years is that, you know, we can stop the games and just go into this practice type mode. Um, we've always said that that's always been a fiber. Aaron, in our industry, um, whether it's Tony, Adam, or, you know, Eric Raish and stopping the game and all that, we all believe this. And, you know, I tell a lot of coaches out there, you know, the tournaments are great and all that stuff, but the kids are losing their ability to learn how to play the game. And I know this from firsthand from all my resources, and Tony knows this and Rob does too, about their guys in big leagues and the connections we have with major league players and college coaches is that they're getting kids that don't know how to play mm -hmm. right now. And I, I feel it's my job as a coach is to teach every kid that even whether they play for me or not, teach them how to play because that's, what's lacking in our industry is their ability to know what to do with the ball and when to do it in situations. And I, I just feel like, and I, and I know Tony believes this too, is that uh, we're trying to teach the game. And that's part of promoting the game is trying to teach it, teach the game rather than be a, what I call an inside player or, yeah. <laughs> you know, or a facility player as, as I call them. So I'm glad you said that, Tony, because that's something that I think all the coaches need to hear out there is that we need to teach, keep teaching the game, how to play the game rather than be one of those inside players. Yeah. One of, I mean, I'm going to name drop here for a second, but I remember, this was maybe, you know, I don't know how many years ago. Um, we had some kids who had gone down to uh, the Fullerton camp with, uh, and I talked to Coach Vanderhoek. I mm -hmm. said, hey, just checking in, see how my guys went. Mm -hmm. You know, just because, you know, how we, we're just putting in good word for our players. Right. Um, uh, and he says, he goes, and he, the, probably the compliment that I took, I take a lot of pride in. And I know coaches do like, you know, and him saying, man, I know which kids were yours. And I was like, you did kind of laughing. And I was like, they have their hats on. And he's like, no, nah, they lined up right. They knew where to throw the ball. Like, I was like, that to me, that was such a great compliment. Like, I know it's just a passing word for him, but for me, man, that was just so awesome to hear like, Hey, that's, that means we're doing something right. Right. Our kids stand out in a certain way, whatever way that is, but 
you know, a, a coach like, you know, Hook, who's a good guy and right. we've known forever to say something like that is, you know, that's, that takes a lot of pride. And that makes me kind of reinforce the idea. Like that means there's a lot of kids who don't do that yeah. and no fault of their own. I, yeah. I'll be on it. I'm not, I'm not faulting the kids at all. I fault the programs, the coaches, you know, I've done high school. I've done all. And I know that look, there's plenty of guys that are just volunteering and helping and, and, and creating that environment. Totally understand that. But just in general, that's, you know, to go back to your, your, your question, Aaron, is we just, we're losing some of that yeah. for the, but again, from a good spot, meaning like we've, we've talked it like train, 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 and, you know, but we've, yeah. we've, instead of having that kind of Venn diagram where all three are working together, we have like train and play are forcing out like this IQ of baseball, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Um, and again, not for anybody's fault. It's just the way it is. You know, most things in life don't stay in balance for very long, right? One right. starts to overtake and that's kind of what's happening. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of that just has to do with, <clears throat> you know, the evolution of travel baseball and the, you know, the commodity, you know, making it a commodity now and that yeah. capitalistic aspect. And, you know, one of the things that you know, that's why I think people gravitate to metrics so much because everyone wants a formula, you right. know? And, and so when you can see numbers, that kind of justifies a decision, you know, or mm -hmm. a value. And, you know, I always say there's two, two sides to, uh, to sport. There's art and there's science. I think art leads the science, but I think because people want to quantify and commodify, I can't even say it, but make, you know, they, they, they use the numbers as a way of putting the value and yeah. they're not looking at the intrinsic sorts of things that you're talking about. Um, and it's, it's that voice or that, that voice is louder than, Hey, what are the nuances of the sport? What is the, What's my sport IQ? Because what's sold to kids are, you know, come, come do the showcase. And then the first thing that they, you know, they do is they put up 60 time, you know, <laughs> exit speed, you know. And so that's how athletes kind of will measure themselves against mm -hmm. each other. And the parents are, are, are using that as uh, a yardstick to, hey, you know what? My money was well spent or it wasn't well spent. Right. You know? right. And, and so I don't know if, you know, again, like you said, maybe the pendulum will swing back the other way. And we'll get maybe what I might call more athlete or, or baseball purists who are really talking about, hey, you know, how do we play the game versus just these metrics? Um, but yeah, that's something that I think is going to be continued um, uh, uphill battle for all sports. Yeah, you know, because and you do have to measure like I like yeah. we're not here bashing, you know, like anything no, I, like you, because if you are training, you do have to measure like, how do you know if you're getting better? Right. Like right. if I'm trying to be a faster, quicker player, well, I'm going to have to measure that. So I really need to know my 60 time, my shuttle time. That's all great. But again, when we when we when that overtakes the idea of learning to play the game the correct way, mm -hmm. that's where I think we, we when the balance is is lost. Mm hmm. That's really where we run into it. I think where we start to do a disservice to our players. Um, and I think, Aaron, this all ties into the social media thing. Like everybody wants to have, like they like said, when you go to a, an event, parents and everybody want some sort of value. And so the mm -hmm. value is the internet has my son posted and they graded him a X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. And here's a 60 time, right? That's where they can have something tangible to tell grandma or friend, you know, at work right. or whatever. Again, it's not a knock. It's, it is what it is in the sense of it's out there. Some people really like it. I, when we run our NorCal World Series, like we never used to post anything like that. It was just like you come and play. The coaches are watching. That's what matters. Right. Yeah. Wow. But it got, it got it got to the point like five years ago, six years ago, where I got so inundated with people going, "I need my sixty time. I need my <laughs> I need all that." Yeah. Which was fine. Again, hey, look, I want to provide the value because I'm if I if I'm asking you to to, to be invested in an event we're doing, then I'm going to provide as much value as possible. And if that means giving you bat speed, having, you know, a track man and um, mm -hmm. you know, scout cast in and give you all those metrics, then I'll do it. And we'll do it as a program, not a problem. 
but I always caution everybody, right? It doesn't mean anything besides a number right now, yes. right? Um, and so use it for a measuring stick. Um, you know, that's that's one of the things like with, uh, you know, Program 15 and Jeremy Booth and those guys, okay. I think they do a nice job also. And I tell our guys, pick one of them, a Program 15, you know, a perfect game, and maybe do one as a, as a freshman or an eighth grader, just so you have some metrics. Right. And then do it again a year later. So compare yourself. That That's part of it. But I think we, we really are doing a disservice when a guy has like 19 events with this program it's like what yeah. what do you think was going to happen in the last six weeks yeah. right why do you need to go get reevaluated so um right. those things have a place for sure um but i think we need to focus on that being a measuring stick as opposed to yeah. it means you know what i mean like this is right. what i have to do in order to to become a better player now you said something that was pretty interesting and you know you said that these coaches are getting these all-stars, but they don't know how to play the game. So is that partly on the coach? Because, you know, we've talked about this a lot too, is that there's a level of physicality that has to be present. Yes. And, and so, you know, does that kind of feed into it? Because again, you can have, I run this all the time. You have a kid who can pitch his ass off throwing 85 miles an hour, mm -hmm. but he's not going to get the looks because right. he's not throwing 90. Mm -hmm. You know, and and is it because maybe baseball is kind of like football in the sense where it's, hey, I need the body. I need the physicality. I need the athleticism. And because we can specialize now, you know, we can make this guy just a closer. We can make this guy just a setup guy. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, that they're they're erring on. Hey, I'll take that physicality. I'll take that athleticism and then I'll just teach them this narrow skill set and yeah. get them good at that yeah two things number one is if you're a coach and you're a coach a successful coach and maybe you're at a you, you get to the point where you're at a pretty high level right you're big time high school program but you get to the part of recruiting what we're talking about jc division one two three pro whatever every coach is arrogant enough to think that they can change every player right and make them <laughs> so hey you give me a 93 mile an hour guy i'll make him a pitcher right well We've all watched a lot of college baseball where a guy comes in throwing 95 and he can't get out of an inning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's got great stuff, but if he's 2-0 all the time, right, or he doesn't throw enough strikes or the feel isn't there, yeah, okay, that, that's where we run into that. Like, the metrics are there, and I think there's pressure on coaches and when we're talking about recruiting and stuff is, why didn't you get the 95-mile-an-hour guy? Because if he turns out, whoa, you missed out on a first round guy. Right. You know? um, and I remember Jerry Weinstein uh, years ago, t we were doing a pitching thing. And he said the difference, and this was a while ago. So when he's, you know, we're talking about like 85 versus 90. Now we're talking about like 89 versus 95, 96. Yeah. <laughs> but back then it was like, I remember him saying, hey, the 85 mile an hour guy that can pitch has to prove himself every single day he goes out there the guy throwing 1991 has to prove he cannot pitch <laughs> they don't bring to come out of the game you know what i mean like the difference yeah, is yeah. one guy you're looking to see is he good enough and or like um if he's not producing we're gonna give him multiple opportunities because he's at 9091 exactly the 85 right. mile hour guy is like hey we gave you a shot man it didn't work out yeah <laughs> right yeah. And so as an 85, I got to prove myself every time out. The right. 192 guy has to just show incremental improvement to be like, yeah, we're going to get there. Right. Um, and, you know, hey, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's the reality of it, exactly. you know. Um, but the, I think the, the key, though, is that there's enough baseball out there, and especially with social media and the, like, no one's hidden. If you really want to play, you're an 84 mile an hour pitcher, 84, 86, and you've got feel, you're going to get overlooked by all the big power fives. Don't, you know, like right. it's just the way it is. And maybe not, but in general, you are. There's enough D2s, NAIAs that you can go out there and have an awesome career and get a great education. And you know what? If all of a sudden your junior year, you pop to near all of a sudden now throwing 92, 93. Hey, you, you've got a chance now to get drafted and 
with the transfer portal, you may take a year or two and go and end up at that. I mean, I think schools <laughs> that are are recruiting some kids now saying, hey, you can come here and, and if you do great for a couple of years, you can just transfer on out. Oh, yes. <laughs> wild, I mean, wild West. Yeah, and, you know, and again, that's not a knock. Yeah. If that's the landscape you're given, you got to use that. You can't, you know what I mean? Like if, if they're told, yeah, you can transfer. And if a kid's maybe a marginal power five kid, why, if I'm one of those, you know, maybe second tier, you know, not a power five school, right. I want that kid and I'll tell him, yeah, dude, okay, come. You got a chance to pitch for us or hit for us. Mm -hmm. And if you do great, we're, we'll help you get in the transfer portal and move on. That's, that's the landscape. Yeah. So if you're going to create that, that as an NCAA and as a governing body, then as a coach, I mean, you, EJ, you know this, the one thing the coaches like dislike the most right now is having to recruit the transfer portal. It's All like right. they have to wake up every morning and look at the transfer portal because <laughs> they can't be late. It's like they'll call kids and be like, I've already talked to 10 schools. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. They have a guy that does that in their program. That's right. They now have a transfer guy who's in charge of recruiting the transfer portal. And exactly. um, I think it's I think it's tough for high school kids because high school kids no longer are just being yeah. recruited against who's on your roster or maybe right. a JC kid. It's now who's on the roster, who's in the transfer portal, who's coming from a JC. Like, oh. it, it's it's tougher for uh, for high school kids now. Absolutely. Um, but like you said, it's a wild wild west, and without until it gets governed, it's it's going to be that way. And again, I no fault of any coaches. It's not a knock on coaches who are doing that. To me, you do what you need to do as a program, right? As at, at that level to bring in kids. If you can get two or three kids who come with that, even that idea of I'm going to try to make it here and coach, I am going to trans try to transfer if I outgrow the program. Hey, I got two great years out of you, right? Okay. We got, we got about four or five more minutes because I know you're on a, a time yeah. here. Um, I guess, EJ, do you have a question for him? Um, you know, I mean, we've covered so many, so many good things, you know, Aaron, and, you know, just, I don't have another question for Tony, because I could talk to Tony all day, you <laughs> know, about, about the game, and I have so much respect for Tony. Yeah. First now of all, we've so we got to have you back, Tony. Um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, hey, I would, I would love to come on because, um, and maybe we can make this kind of a summary, because you had mentioned the idea of, of you know, trying to bring baseball back to maybe underserved uh, communities, right? Right. Um, and that's something that I would love to talk to you two about again, because I know that Rob and myself have have put forth some efforts a lot of times, and um, you know we've hit some roadblocks, and and we can talk about those things, and, and maybe we'd love to try to try to work on things like that. So I think that's a topic that would be super interesting and um, something that's probably needs to be talked about more it really does mm -hmm. yeah well actually one of the things that I, uh, me and ej are doing is we're working with tyson ross's loyal to the yeah. soil yeah. program and game speed's going to host their next clinic uh, i think it's october 16th yeah, 16th. Um, and that's kind of one of those outreach outreach programs that yeah. uh, we'll try and get you know those underserved kids into baseball and seeing high level training and, and that sort of thing um Quickly, what are probably your two favorite tourneys for your athletes to go play in? Yeah, so um, so probably my two favorite, like one of them's kind of an off the radar one down in San Diego. The it's it used to be called the Phil Singer. Yeah, uh, Phil was an umpire down there for years, mm -hmm. and um, unfortunately he passed away years, uh, you know, about ten years ago. But the tournament is just a, an event. He brings. It used to be. Washington teams versus California teams. And it's kind of grown into this event, but it's down in San Diego and it's like a, you play six pool games and you get a day off and you, then you play in this double elimination tournament. And honestly, I love it because it's one of those tournaments where it's, I don't know, it's, it, it just feels like you're just playing baseball, mm. right? Because there's no social media on it. There's no rankings on it. There's right. no nothing. Like the only people who know what's going on really are the college coaches and the kids playing in it. And I, to me, that reminds me of the purity of baseball. It's like, we're going to go play a doubleheader and then we're all going to go as a team and go have dinner down, you know, in Laguna or go up to Orange County or go down to San Diego. And it's like pure, 
Mm -hmm. No social media, no rankings, no all tournament teams, no, none of that. Just you got, you played a bunch of games. It was awesome. Right. So I love that event. Um, And, you know, we, I think the other one is, I do think, even though perfect game has become this huge, whatever, right. It's conglomerate of whatever they do a really nice job. I think they do a good job with their events. And so uh, Marcus, who runs a lot of the stuff out here in the West Coast, I, you know, I think he does a good job uh, with the uh, Perfect Game World Series stuff out in Arizona. That's really I good. Think, I think the idea behind that is is a good idea. And I, I know it, they, they've expanded it more. But when they first started, I think where there were 16 teams or eight teams. Uh-huh. And it's like, yeah, the big events out in East Cobb and all that stuff where it's 300 and plus teams, like the idea behind it was – can we get through all the pool play games and all the kind of like teams that aren't quite, I want to get down to like us for like, let's get all the good teams together that we know we're going to be quality. Yeah. Um, not just, uh, you know, maybe they've got a couple of good players. Like let's get down to maybe the more elite groups. And that's kind of what they do with the world series. I think you kind of go there knowing like there is no looking at your pool and going, we should win these three or four games. Like, no, like everybody we play is going to be a guy. Everybody's, you know, so, so I think that's a great measuring stick for you as a program and for our players, right? Yeah. Hey guys, here are the best players in your class, essentially. See where you measure. Right. right. They both had, they, you know, the both ends of the spectrum, they both have a place in baseball for sure. Well, hey man, like I said, I know you got to go. It's, it's right on the dot there. Perfect. Love talking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time talking with us. Um, hey, NorCal heavy hitter, Tony Cavello. <laughs> Thanks, NorCal guys. This baseball. was awesome. Yeah, Thanks. I enjoyed it. Like I said, I love talking. And again, don't don't forget, let's 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 come back in and uh, hit that topic. I'd love to come back and talk about it. Oh, love to. Hey, it's a date. Next, we get your partner in crime on. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get all of my, I sent him out to Arizona. It's, it's that time of year, right? So I sent him out to Arizona for five weeks and a couple teams every week and say, I'll see you in six weeks, buddy. Hey, there you go. I'm coming for him. <laughs> all right. <laughs> hey, take us out, EJ. Well, hey, thanks again, Tony. Appreciate it. Hey, this is the brand, Eric Johnson. And it's Coach Aaron, the source. We'll see you.